Hi everyone, welcome to Ask ALB, a new podcast that features interviews with prominent lawyers and thought leaders. We will discuss legal trends, create usable takeaways that tackle pressing legal issues, and hear inspiring stories from senior lawyers. My name is Amantha Chia from Asian Legal Business. We are very excited to do this show and hope that you'll find it enjoyable and useful for your work. Today, we have Hyun Wong, the founder of Hyun Wong & Co. and former Greater China Managing Partner at both Simmons & Simmons and Fried Frank. Hyun spent 18 years at Simmons & Simmons from 1988 and then 15 years at Fried Frank. He is a senior crown counsel at the Attorneys General's Chambers and an ex-president of the Law Society of Hong Kong. Wong also has decades of public service experience, including stints with the Department of Justice, the Legislative Council of the Hong Kong Government, and the Competition Commission. Hyun is additionally a former chairman of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Centre and former president of the Inter-Pacific Bar Association. So welcome, um, Hyun. Hi. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you for your invitation. That's right. So today, right, we want to actually get to know Hyun Wong a little bit better, right? Um, so we're going to ask you some questions. Uh, and let's start with, right, can you tell us a little bit more about your childhood, your education background and family, right? What are some of your defining moments of childhood um, that you can share with our audience? Wow. Thanks. Well, my childhood, um, I um, I was born in the 50s and that was during the baby boom years. And then, hence, I was born in a, at that time, considered a mid-sized family. That means five brothers and sisters. So it's sort of a huge family by modern day standard. And, but in those days, it was perfectly normal. In fact, it was not big at all. Five people with just normal size. And I happen to be the eldest in the family. That's something I always joke about. So look, if there's a second life that people ask, do you want to go return to Earth in your reincarnation? Do you want to be a human or a horse? And so I will ask, uh, well, what will I be? Well, you will be the eldest child in the family. So, oh, okay. The next question will be, would it be a rich family or poor family? <laughs> Is it poor family? Oh, in that case, I would rather be a horse. Yeah. Because being the eldest uh, member of a big uh, family, but poor family during difficult time, you get to share all the burdens uh, of your parents. You you got to know the financial situation of whom you you under you have to because you're the oldest, right? So you have to stand in in front of all the other younger brother sister who can hide behind you, and you have to look after them. And you, you will be the only child who will know exactly what's going on in the family between the parents, especially during difficult times. But anyway, there you are. I was born in a humble family. Father was a primary school teacher, teaching the wrong subject with his English lit literature. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Chinese literature. In the fifties, if you could teach some rudimentary English, will be considered really good. But if you were teaching Chinese, nobody would pay much attention to you. So there you are. So that is how I was brought up. But then uh, I think the dividing time is father. Father would, uh, uh, being the oldest son, I would have to listen to his endless lecture on how to be a good person, how to be a useful person. And, the, and however poor we might be, the father, especially my father, he says, I have to receive as much education as good. And so um, that really was the biggest uh, um, incentive for me to work hard and be. And, and I, a lot of my friends in those days could only finish primary education or a few years in secondary education and they would start doing, picking up a trade and be a whatever, a carpenter, uh, whatever, a, a bricker, for example. But I managed to finish my secondary school. Then very luckily I got into university. So the rest is history. <laughs> Have you always wanted to be a lawyer? It's such a cliche question, right? But <laughs> when did you realize that you want to be a lawyer? I think it started with, uh, yeah, I always wanted to be a lawyer. Right? But then in those days being a lawyer is not easy. Not that you'll have to do extremely 
well academically, but in those days, sadly, you still had to come from the right family background in Hong Kong. In those days. But there wasn't even a law faculty in Hong Kong. There was only a law school. We all have to take the uh, qualification examination, the, U- the UK examination. Right? But anyway, that was the uh, old days. Um, I think uh, all my, uh, I have two uncles, my mother's side, right? They always say, come on, don't waste your time. Don't stop dreaming and take up a trip because they were both car mechanics. They they both encouraged me to be a car mechanic. I happened to like motor cars. I said, hey, come on, if you if you follow me, you'll be my apprentice. You will make yourself a very good car mechanic. You'll make a lot of money. I almost joined them, but at that time, my father said, no, you continue to stay at school. Yeah, your father's an academic. Two uncles, but I, yes, they said, why? When are you going to, to my garage? I said, look, I, was, I had a dream. I would like to be a lawyer one day. Ha, 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 yes, good luck to you. Look, but I would like you to have an insurance policy. You continue to dream your dream, but you should pick up the car mechanics, <laughs> which I did not. Anyway, there you are. I joined. Um, in, eventually, I got into university. I did a degree in uh, history and mm. political science and English literature at the time. Then I joined the Hong Kong government. And then two years after I joined the Hong Kong government, there was a circular from the uh, civil service training branch to say that they they do they did offer one or two scholarships for civil servant to uh, go to UK to read law, and I applied. And very luckily, I got in. Those days was highly competitive. You're talking about wow. out of three three to five hundred civil service, only one or two who got this scholarship. And then I was very lucky. I got there. You are. This is amazing. That's amazing. So once you graduated from law school, right, tell us a little bit more about your career journey. What what brought you here? What are some of your highlights that you can look back, right, in your very, um, you know, experience, almost 30 years, more than 30 years um, in the legal industry? More than 30 years. More than 30 years. Oh, yeah, quite a bit more. But anyway, that's right. I uh, One of the uh, conditions of being sent to the UK to read law but to sign a contract with the Hong Kong government that once you're qualified, you have to return to Hong Kong and work as Crown Council uh, at the, then it was called the AG's uh, Chambers, uh, Attorney General's Chambers. And then you have to work there for five years, right? Otherwise you have to repay every single penny the government spent on you, okay? So I did return to Hong Kong and I worked at the um, AG Chambers as Crown Council, and very quickly I was promoted to senior Crown Council rank, which I was very, very proud. Of. In those days, you do you, you did not expect to be promoted during the first seven to ten years, actually. And I got promoted to in two years. I was very wow. lucky. But there's another story. I would rather not mention it now. But then. Uh, that's why I uh, was very happy with the Hong Kong government, and I never dream of leaving the government. To me, that would be my entire career. But then, I was very naughty. I, when I was in the government, I assisted. Uh, I was only a very junior person working in a group, which was handling the, at that time, with the largest arbitration building up an uh, arbitration case of the uh, hospital, Prince of Wales Hospital. I was a only, only very junior guy, but somehow I must have impressed the QC uh, from London who was handling it. And he liked me a lot. He said, oh, that's a young man. i like, probably I look after his uh, hotel accommodation and make sure he got the lunch <laughs> table ready. But I think I did some research for him and he was pretty impressed. And because of that, uh, later on, um, the senior guy I worked for left the government to join Simmons and Simmons. And then he invited me to leave as well. I was tempted, but I thought, no, I think I better stay with the Hong Kong government. But then I went to, he said, no, come on, come over to my firm, Simmons and Simmons, just to see my senior partner, just have a word, right? Uh, let's see whether you may like it. And then I went over, I just thought, couldn't say hello. Ah, yeah, let's take a look at another city firm, right? And see how it is like from inside. And then there was a contract on the table. 
and I look at the contract, I said, oh dear, is that what you're going to offer me? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have to call to my mother that I got an offer. And the mother said, sorry, h- how many zeros again? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the rest of history, then I joined Simmons and Simmons. Right. I mean, sometimes you can't plan for these things, right? You just have to go with the flow of what life, what life gives you. Yeah, this is true. But funny enough, I was then, because the, uh, the uh, arbitration of the, ho- the hospital, the construction arbitration continued, and have, they had to breathe out to Simmons and Simmons because the uh, Crown Council in charge of the case left to join Simmons and Simmons. So I, I left to join him, right? So they formed a team outside yes. of the government. And so I worked until the case was settled, uh, sorry, was decided, right? And we won the case, of course. Right? Anyway, you can't believe it. 35 years later, I joined the hospital authority as a board, me- a board member, right? And then they look at my CV and say, hey, you're you, you, you involved in building construction work. I say, yeah, yeah, of course. They say, look, in that case, you should chair the works committee, right? The, uh, capital Works Committee, because we have a lot of a hospital redevelopment project, a new hospital project. I said, yeah, sure, sure. So I have to uh, chair the Capital Works Committee of the Hospital Authority. And then among all the projects, uh, con- there was all, they were ongoing. I noticed that one of them is the Prince of Wales Hospital. I said, what, what are we going to do? Said, oh. That hospital is considered a bit too old. We need to redevelop it now. Is it? What? Plus, do you know that as a newly qualified lawyer, that was my first arbitration case. It was a brand new hospital. That's why, you know, we have all the disputes arising. Now you say this hospital is too old. Say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So your job is to demolish and rebuild it. Look, that must reflect on I have now complete a full cycle. <laughs> so wow. I start my uh, career by uh, looking at this new hospital's uh, a related arbitration case. And now during my, just when I was about to retire, I now have to look after the redevelopment of the same hospital. There you are. That's very sad. I'm it's very right. fulfilling, I think. <laughs> I think it's very fulfilling, right? It's sad. So, Hyun, you have been managing partner at two international firms, right? And now you're managing your own firm. Can you tell us a little bit more about Hyun Wong and Co? And what will be some of your priorities uh, for the new firm? Um, well, actually, um, when the office was opened last month, a lot of my friends mm-hmm. said, a lot of flowers. And I said, no, 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 come on, no, don't do that. And then a lot of them, you know, they would put a um, um, congratulatory message okay. says, oh, uh, wishing you a lot All of the best. And they will start, you know, raining on you, things like that, right? <laughs> City has a lot. No, 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 no. You got it all wrong. I think this is the office which I will, you know, there will be a one man bank just to have facilitate my arbitration work by acting as arbitrator. And I will not uh, handle any client work. And a lot of people even know, should I instruct you to do something? So I can't do anything, it's just by myself. I have never handled a conveyancing work. I, don't come to me when you're in a divorce case. I have no idea where, where how it's done. So basically, I just will continue to act as arbitrator. And of course, I'm also very active uh, uh, doing a lot of public duties work because I'm chairing the Indian Revenue Review Board. So I have to hear a lot of tax appeal cases. And also, I am a member of several uh, disciplinary tribunals. So I am pretty busy. I'm basically playing, you know, adjudicator just rather than lawyer these days. But it must be great, right? Being able to pick where your passion is and going in that direction. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when people, well, when you, um, when you have uh, been playing lawyer for so long, sometimes it's nice to be sitting so the speaker on the bench to watch your know, younger generation, you know, how they present a case before you. That was quite interesting, very fulfilling actually. Yeah. Some of them, yes, but you but to be absolute on it, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add this one. Very often when you 
ah, when you hear these young Turks who come before you, <laughs> you often say that, well, blimey, lucky that I don't have to fight against you guys because the young people are getting, they are very, very good. They're very eloquent, very confident, very articulate. I mean, I don't know, it must be something to do with them. They've been watching TV since they're children and have how case there are so many you know the uh tv programs uh episodes uh, all these uh soap opera about life in in court right and efficacy uh, lifestyle and and i think people are getting so much better really honestly truly very often when you hear these young lawyers fighting a case before you just feel that you're so lucky that you do not have to fight against them. <laughs> why, why do you think that has changed, right? I mean, what kind of tips will you give to the young lawyers? I'm sure that there must be still uh, some areas that they can learn from the senior senior lawyers, right? And why do you think that has changed, right? That, that, that has really changed in the last 20 years with these new lawyers coming, coming up stronger? And what, what was the advantage that they have? Everything, but then let me see how we're going to start. Now I'm also involved in the uh, in the uh, in that legal education in various universities. To start of an, the university side, the um, you have to thank all the universities of all the um, the re in recent year of the MOOC program is so advanced, right? The students long before they graduate, long before they qualify, they already trained to be good advocates. And they are so articulate, and uh, the and also the presentation of skills is so much better than nowadays. They have a lot, a lot of training. And number two, uh, um, also, it's all about education system, really. Because to me, in my days, I could not think of any of my relatives who are lawyers, even if I want to look up to someone to try to learn from somebody. Uh, Very look little up. role models. But now, a lot of the younger generation of lawyers, you often hear their fathers, their parents are lawyers, they, they have a brother who is also a, a very successful uh, barrister or solicitor. So they all learn from from their relatives, good friends, so their whole entire upbringing is different. Then, last but not least, is that, Gosh, this day with modern technology, internet, they learn everything so much easier than our time. So that what, also help. That that has all helped the role mm. of technology, uh, quality of education, and so on, right? So, so you, you do do you have any tips for them for this young lawyer starting their career? Do you think what if you were to meet, meet one of them? Um, out of school, right? Out of their 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 two years into their career, what 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 do some tips be um, for them starting their career in Hong Kong um, in the legal industry? I, I don't want to stay the office because if you why don't you hit the button on you know, Google the how to be a good lawyer? Gosh, you have a lot of tips on the internet, right? Oh, you have to learn to be good. Uh, you have to be analytical. You have to be creative. You have to perseverance, and you have to. You have a lot of quality required, and they're all true, of course, right? But then, if you ask me, it's you want to ask me to single out one element, right? Being a good lawyer, one quality. I would choose knowledge, industry knowledge, because things have changed. In those days, as a lawyer, you sit there, you wait for your client to come to you and seek legal advice, and you have absolutely very little knowledge about what your client is doing. You just give them all this legal mumbo-jumbo to tell them, yes, on the one hand, you may not, on the other hand, you may not be, and then the the... The clients very often it's very difficult to make a decision. Now, it, should I or should I not go ahead, or, or do I or do I have have a chance to win this case? And can I or can I not you know, successfully float my shares? You know, things like that, right? But these days, it's so competitive. When you pitch for a job, be it a financial deal, be it a 
corporate finance or capital markets like your like an IPO job, right? Or it could be a transactional matter in doing an M and A, right? Or you you are working, or you are a pitching for a job from a private equity fund. You want to invest money and in a certain company and merge with a company, things like that. The first thing you 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 approach them is that oh I can do an MA very I I know all the uh, ins and outs I can uh, give you all the documents you need to very quickly turn 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 over all the documents and I will ask all the right question I will put in all the right uh, boilerplate clauses all the right direct and warranty things like that they will just look at you so can your competitors they can all do that right but then one thing they will only be impressed if they said, "Hey, this is um, whatever, let's say, medical equipment, you know, company." Then, wow, you start telling them all your knowledge in life science, medical, pharmaceutical things like that. They will be impressed. You see what I mean? Because they expect you to know exactly what they do. All right. And if you just say that I can be your lawyer, but I know nothing about the industry, what you are doing, you don't stand a chance. Trust me. They will say next. You, you see what I mean? That is one thing. So how then? How could you, how how can I acquire all this knowledge? Well, you read a lot and you listen a lot to other people. When you have a friend who just handled a case, a mining company, whatever, you just. Try to listen and learn. Later, you have a similar case. Oh, yeah, but I think I know how to handle one. That is exactly what you do, and also preparation, of course. All right, just walk into a client when you are going into a beauty parade. Be prepared. Do not tell them you can. You have all the technical skills or the legal skills. They will not be sufficient. But that's only a starting point. You must impress your prospective client that you know their business very well. Absolutely. Thank you for those tips. Hugh, and I think, you know, when talking to very senior lawyers like yourself, what people always want to know is how do you manage your time? Because time is one resource that is fixed for everybody, right? We all get the same amount of time. And yet, you know, you seem to be able to fit in a lot of things. Can you share some of your time management tips? Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. I think I, um, I have a... I'm famous or infamous <laughs> for doing too many duties, public duties. They are either government duties or work for other uh, for the professional bodies, right? I'm, I'm involved in anything you mention, right? almost everything. But funny enough, people ask, "How do you manage time?" It's, it's not that difficult because. You have to remember one thing. How do you have time to rest, to relax? I say, yes, I do. So how do you relax? Well, you relax by all my back medical friend, doctors, friends agree with me. You rest by doing different things. You do not rest by putting up your feet and lie on the couch, lie in bed and not doing and not moving anything. You will do one thing in the morning, do a different thing in the afternoon, to, something totally different in the afternoon, that will be relaxation. I always use this example, okay? You know that I love, oh, I, I work hard, but I also play hard. I love golf. I play a lot of golf, right? So a lot of people say, that, gosh, you have time to play golf. Say, yeah, so good, good for you, it's good relaxation. Said, no, talk to the professional pro. They, Talk to the top, you know, golfers. Playing golf to them is their job. Do you agree? Right? They are talking yes. about millions of dollars. One putt, you know, you miss one putt will mean ten million dollars easily, right? So, so to them, it must be very stressful that they play golf. Do you agree? So imagine one of the top um, tour player one morning. Gallup said to his wife, hey, darling, I'm not going to work today. I'm very tired. I want to do something different. May I come to your office? But his wife happened to be doing, let's say, some import export business, right, running an office. Then the husband, who's a professional golfer, would, would say to his wife, I would like to 
stop working today. I may I come to your office and help you to handle some of your paperwork so so that I can get some relaxation. It sounds quite reasonable to agree, but then think think about that. So playing golf is not just relaxation; it could be work. Doing office work is always is not just pushing pencil, but it could be relaxation. It depends on what you do otherwise for a living. So that means always variety. If you do different different things, you are relaxing. You agree? And I like to play the guitar. You know, I have a I form a very geriatric rock band. <laughs> but you see. In the evenings, I will play with my friends, you know, uh, like, come on, let's take turn and, and play some oldie, good oldies, right, song. So this relaxation. But do you know that some people, they make a living by playing in a band every night? Do you agree? So to them, it's work. To us, relaxation. To everybody, it's just variety. Do different things at different time in the day, you get your rest, your relaxation. There's no need to just sit down doing nothing, touching a glass of whiskey and watching TV. You can be relaxed by doing other things. Wow, that's incredible, right? I mean, now we know your secret, trying to do many things at the same time. Um, Hugh, you know, speaking of doing many things, um, I found out, you, you mentioned it before we started the recording, that you used to do television shows in the past, right? That sounds very interesting and very, you know, I like what we think of lawyers. Can you tell us more about that um, that, that past, right? What, what kind of television shows or what do you get from that experience? Um, yeah, it was an accident, actually. Uh, I uh, was uh, yeah was asked to uh, do uh, an appearance on one program. I forgot what it was, and then yeah 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 I was I was giving some personal views on some something happened in society, and from a lawyer's perspective, what would you uh, comment on this one is oh that guy was on the verge of uh, breaking the law and da 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 things like that, and then. Somehow, the producer of the program approached me to say, hey, wow, Mr. Wong, you're really, really good. Would you consider doing it on regular basis? I said, well, <laughs> are you sure I can do it? Yeah. So later, one thing led on to the other. I appeared during my past 30 years on three, four television show when I was an anchor. And I, um, for example, I interview people, I interview politicians. I um, uh, I was a commentator of um, some government policies, things like that, and uh, this also some some soft, you know, the program like uh, gave people. Yeah. I remember I mentioned history. Do you remember when I first uh, at my first degree history? So I talk about history of Hong Kong and also try to and also I did say that I I, I read English as a second degree. Uh, my <clears throat> yes, yeah. So during my first degree, I read all this. So I actually uh, gave people the historical developments of Chinkush or Hong Kong English, and people find it interesting. You know that people who've been to Hong Kong, as you, Amanda, will, you 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 must have the experience. Right? You talk to a Hong Kong er, Hong Kong person, he can't finish a sentence without slotting in a word or two in English. Do you agree? You go into the lift, people are standing next to you. They may be speaking Cantonese, but somehow English words will come out. I yes. often say to my expatriate friends, are you, uh, do you understand Hong Kong, Hong Kong Chinese? They say, yeah. Although I have no idea what they're talking about, but every now and then when they have to, you know, put in a, a word or two in English, then you somehow, you will tune in. You, you you more or less know what they're talking about. But anyway, so I was a, a program to tell people about the origin of some Hong Kong expressions, which are mainly English and not Chinese. And a lot of people would not believe, would not believe, believe me. Do you know that a lot of expression like boycott is a it, it's, it's boycott is boycott in Cantonese in Hong Kong. Do you know that? Oh, and really? Would, yeah, yeah, yeah. And nobody would ever consider that it is English, right? Uh, it's a fluke. Fluke is Cantonese. Oh, what a fluke! It's a fluke, but actually, it is a, it is Cantonese. So I try to give this 
um, I've done a lot of research, and and that program was most successful. Yeah, I absolutely uh, uh, shoplifting. For example, I told them shoplifting in Cantonese. In con in Cantonese, shoplifting is shoplifting. Trust me. But a lot of people never have uh, tried to understand the origin and why it was called shoplifting until I told them. Excuse me, this Chinese comes from shoplifting because there is such an English word. And then a lot of people were surprised. But anyway, there you are. Now, you then I, uh, what, what have I learned? <laughs> I learned one thing. Uh, as a lawyer, you, you're already used to your advocacy skills. You have, to be a, you have to be competent enough to be on your feet and start talking, right? And you control the speed. I speak a bit fast, but in court, I control my speed easily. Your voice, and also because these programs I just mentioned, they are mainly live, live shows. Wow, it is quite challenging and very um, pressurizing. You can see that. Uh, you look at the monitor. You are facing you with a circle with five, four. Three, two, one. The cameraman will give you a signal. You're on, and then immediately look at camera one. The light is on. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the show, the talk show of the lawyers and your life. And tonight I have my. That's just I'm professional. Eh? That's how you do it. So that gives you a lot of experience later on when you are asked to give a speech. For example, during my two years as a uh, the president of the Law Society. Often people ask you, hey, we have invited the president of the Law Society, Mr. Hin Wong, to come to make a speech. You said, fine, you just get on. And sometimes, unexpectedly, they would like you to say a few words, and I can always, I can always crack a joke anytime I like. And also the way you deliver the joke. You have to make sure that your audience will laugh, not you, right? But if you are not trained, you'll find that when you want to crack a joke, you're the only one that's laughing, no one else. So all this, I think I learned if I'm doing all these TV shows. It helps a lot. And also one last advice is that what comes out of your mouth is a thousand times more important than what goes into your mouth. So when you talk, always think carefully before words come out. That's an occupation thing, right, with lawyers? Yeah. Yes. You have to think before you talk. So, Hyun, um, while you're going towards the end of our uh, um, interview, I have this one last question, right? Um, I want to say it has been a really odd, odd two years for most of us. Uh, I'm very glad to be able to hold something like that virtually. It's not something that would be that common before the pandemic, right? When you look at the future, you think about the, 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 the years ahead, the future ahead. What do you consider as the big world problem, one big world problem that leaders, world leaders, should address um, in the coming future? What's the most uh, pressing? World leaders. God, Amanda, that's way above my pay grade. I, I, have not, I don't know what to... Again, I'm sure to be a real good world leader, it must command a lot of qualities. It is so difficult to single out which one is most important. But if you really ask me... Yeah, one world problem. Thing, I, I, I think it's not so much quality, but my advice to world leaders is that they all have to work on something, is to develop other people work on a succession plan and allow the younger generation to take over from them. Trust me, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. I always joke about something. I think it's maybe a bit un unkind. Um, I always say that some people or some people suffer what I coin has post presidency or post chairmanship syndrome. 
a lot of people when they have become the president of some organization, some body, professional body, otherwise, or a guild, a trade chairman, they have they're all politician, right? They they don't want to let go. They just want to stay on for as long as they can, and then always have the same excuse. Ah, you see. I really do want to stay that long on the job, but but you see, no one can take over from me. And then I'm, uh, I just started the pro that project, and I can't leave the uh, half cock, so I have to finish it as to see it through. And yeah, and then people who are not so interested any uh, in in this type of work these days, all these are rubbish, absolutely rubbish, because they don't seem to. Uh, like to accept the fact that there are always people who can do better than you, and you are not indispensable. If you are locked down by a bus tomorrow morning, the life life will go on. Whatever you've been doing will continue, and whatever you're doing in that organization, the industry will not collapse just because you are gone. But a lot of people love to stay on the same job and love the. I'm sure it must have the power. That comes with it. It's the the privileges that come with it, the 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 the, the high um, profile they they've been enjoying. I think right. So my advice is that all great leaders must learn to step down at the right time, bow out at the right time, give way to the younger generation. There are other people who can do better, and trust me. The younger generation are better than you are, but sometimes you tend to or you like to overlook the reality, the facts. Would that be a good, um, would you a good point, Amanda? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's a very interesting one, right? I think you've some very, very supportive of the younger generation, both in terms of answering uh, for the kind of tips that you see young lawyers, that you give to young lawyers, seeing how young lawyers start, right? Very different situation that they are in right now uh, to now, right? What world leaders, uh, succession planning is a big topic. I mean, not just for world leaders, I think for big companies as well. All very valid points. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I um I don't want to be a an old crotchety um person. Sound like a broken record. They keep repeating the same thing. I always like to listen to young people's um, views and talk to them and learn from them. And I'm really um, annoyed by older people who keep repeating, "Oh, these young Turks these days, they are not like us. They they don't." They have no moral fiber, and they uh, don't respect older generation, and uh, they are, the, uh, their ambitions are much higher than their capability. All these are rubbish, actually. It's all jealousy. And I think the sooner we accept that the world belongs to the younger generation, the better. So, Hyun, are there any initiatives that you're doing with the younger lawyers to, to help to groom them and prepare them for next steps? Oh no! I still um, um, I as I say, I'm involved in legal education. I uh, I'm a external examiner of um, of uh, two university. I'm a mentor of a lot of young law students. I am a professor of practice in one of the universities. So my job is to uh, assist the younger generation and encourage them to, and um, help them to better equip themselves when they join the legal uh, fraternity one day. Yeah. All, All right. right. I'm talking to you, Amanda. Same here. Thank you so much, Yoon, for your time and sharing your valuable insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. See you Thank soon. Thank you. See you, you Yoon. Have yourself now. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Yoon. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of Ask ALB. Remember, Ask ALB can be streamed on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. We'll catch you in the next episode.